After the glut of grisly home invasion movies through the 2000s, filmmakers in the 2010s were able to have some fun with the format and give us interesting, innovative twists on the subgenre. There was this one night and I was in the basement getting a chicken out of the freezer. I was just bending over and getting it out. And all of a sudden, I got what I can only describe as an enormous sense of dread. In 2014, New Zealand filmmaker Gerard Johnston made a horror comedy that blended the classic haunted house genre with grisly, gory home invasion. There is a man living in the walls of my house, and unless you do something, he's going to kill my mum. Just call my house, please! In 2016, Chris Peckover made a Christmas horror film that at first appeared to be a fun, festive slasher movie only to become something much darker and more sinister. Ashley! Are you hiding? I'll find you. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of home invasion and we discuss Gerard Johnston's Housebound and Chris Peckover's Better Watch Out. Gosh, that's high tech, isn't it? Aren't you lucky, Kylie, having all that fancy technology on your foot? Quite spoiled. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre, one subgenre at a time. We are currently in the middle of our ninth season, exploring the evolution of home invasion, and this is part 28. We've got a really fun double bill for you this week. As that intro suggested, we're going to be talking about Housebound from 2014 and Better Watch Out from 2016. Such a fun pair of films to discuss. Both have plenty of fun, interesting twists and turns throughout, so please do check out both movies before you listen to our spoilerific discussion. So joining me to discuss these two fun but fucked up movies, I've got a brand new guest with me. He was here on our Patreon channel during our Jurassic Park retrospective, but this is his first time on the main podcast. You may recognise him from the Disneyversity podcast, or of course, one of the world's biggest movie podcasts, the Empire podcast. It's Ben Travis. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? I am all good. I have, you know, had a mad week of watching these films that you've set for me. Uh, I've had some laughs. I've had some frights. Yes. I think there's somebody living in my walls. Other than that, I'm great. Excellent. Well, thank you for being here to discuss these two hilarious films. I can't wait to get into them. First of all, Ben, as this is your first time on the main podcast, just tell people out there, for anyone who doesn't know you, a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Yes. Hello, I am Ben. I work for Empire Magazine. I am deputy online editor at Empire. I've been there for... God, five and a half years now, which is mad. That's gone by in the blink it's of an very eye. Cool. Can I just like, how was was that like a bit of a dream come true when you got that job? Because like, I, oh. I imagine about ninety nine percent of film nerds out there in the UK probably have a dream of one day working for empire magazine right i mean that must have been a really wonderful surreal moment when you landed yeah that. i mean i literally cried when i got the call <laughs> from my now boss to be like yeah you you got the job well done i was like <gasps> oh my god because it, it yeah it really was like the dream uh always been a huge movie fan always loved horror films that's why i'm here mm-hmm. um so yeah i mean being at empire has been incredible like the opportunities that come up and just getting to be in that world and talking every day probably too much with my colleagues just about star wars and horror movies (laughs) and more star wars on a weekly basis is like what more could i ask for i love it (laughs) a dream come true i know the feeling um and you also do another podcast though don't you tell us a little bit about that yes uh, i i don't know if the uh people are aware of this, but sometimes uh, men, especially white men, have multiple podcasts. Uh, so I do, yeah, yes. contribute to the Empire podcast on the semi-regular. As you say, we've done Empire podcasts together, which have been tons of fun. So much fun. Yeah. In lockdown, again, it's a lockdown podcast. Hey. Who knew? Uh, me and my good friend, Dr. Sam Summers, who is uh, an animation academic, we started a Disney podcast. So... Obviously, we were all locked down and Disney Plus launched and suddenly it was like, oh, every classic Disney film is now available just to watch. It's just there. And I realized I basically haven't seen very many of them at all in terms of 
We all grew up on the ones that came out in the cinema or were on VHS when we were kids. But really, because of the whole like VHS vault system that Disney had, unless it was released on VHS around when you were a kid, there's probably a load of classic ones where you, you know the songs, you've maybe been to the theme parks, you know the characters and the big moments. But like, have you actually seen the films? And that was me. So yeah. we started a podcast called Disneyversity, uh, where it's basically Sam and I watching through every classic animated Disney film in order. And we've been doing it for a couple of years now, going quite slowly. You came on a couple of months ago and we did The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which I'd never seen before that we did really that episode. Fun. And it is such a banger and you were great on that episode. <laughs> uh, that was me- I mean, it's a messed up Disney film. I mean, a lot of Disney films are quite messed up, actually, as I'm sure, you're di- as I'm sure you've discovered. But uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame has got, I think, maybe one of the darkest kind of villains in Disney's history, right? It's pretty So gnarly. Frollo. Like, the yeah. Yeah. Stuff that Frollo gets up to, not just that he like nearly he murders somebody and then nearly drops a baby down a well in the first five minutes. Yeah. Then has a song about an hour into the film where he is like terrified he is going to hell because he is so horny for Esmeralda. I was like, what am I what am I watching here? What is this? <laughs> it's it's fucked up. That film is fucked up. Yeah, you came on for that episode. We have just done The Emperor's New Groove. We're in uh, what we call oh. the wilderness years at the moment because we've done the Disney Renaissance. We've done all the classics from the 90s that everyone remembers. And now we're in the weird 2000s where it's like, again, what the hell is this movie each week? Sometimes for, for the better, sometimes for the worse. I love it. It's so uh, good. Well, it was worth mentioning because I think everyone who listens to this podcast would really enjoy yours because it has that similar kind of you know it's a real deep dive each week and you go through every disney film in chronological order so you really look at that evolution and it is such a lovely mix of both entertainment and real in-depth knowledge as well that you guys Thank have you, and that is all sam by the way sam is the brains i i watch the films and turn up and like sam what does all of this mean and he knows all the things and so <laughs> he yeah. knows his stuff knows right his stuff. incredible absolutely incredible so disney arguably is about as far away from horror as you can get. Although actually, maybe that's not completely true given some of the stuff we've just discussed and some of the stuff you've covered. But let me ask you, Ben, what is your kind of relationship with Oh, the horror genre? Are you a horror movie fan? Oh, completely. Yeah, I was such a scaredy cat kid. Mm-hmm. I saw films as a kid that just completely messed me up. Jurassic Park, now my favourite film. Mm. Yeah, you terrified me. The Mummy, Stephen Summers, The Mummy. I think I saw when I was eight, and that that was too young. I had like dreams of scarab beetles like running through my skin, and that was obsessed with the idea that in the wardrobe in our bedroom, like a mummy was in there, the gooey mummy. Um, so I was like really scared of stuff as a kid, and then as a teenager, it just flipped the other way, and I was like, I want to watch everything. Yeah. And it was in that kind of grimy 2000s, like, torture porn era. So I was watching Saw and Hostel and all sorts of stuff. And then it really kind of kicked into overdrive when I was a student, basically. Mm. And over the last decade as well, beyond uni, because it's been an incredible decade for horror. And I I found myself really invested in quite a few filmmakers who you're ending, ending up covering in this particular series you're like you're mike flanagan's I'm, I'm a huge mike flanagan fan ty west and adam wingard and all these people who were coming up around the same time and it was like oh there is something really cool happening here so yeah big horror fan uh, there's nothing better than watching a horror movie with a really engaged fun crowd there is there is nothing better than that other than watching a brand new star wars movie on opening day of course of course i love this incredible well let me ask you ben what do you think then of the home invasion subgenre? because you know you mentioned there you're a fan of mike flanagan obviously he made movies like hush but do you find that you enjoy home invasion movies kind of generally it's not my go-to and i don't know i don't think i'm like really scared of home invasion movies in that way but my way in always as a teenager and kind of now is that i like the spooky supernatural stuff so if i hear there's even like yeah i don't know the new joanna hogg movie is like oh it's the characters from the souvenir okay that's interesting plus oh it's a ghost movie there's some vaguely supernatural element Uh, that's what hooks me in yeah and obviously i guess one of the things that is so distinctive about home invasion is that it generally 
tends to be like human people breaking into houses and it's yes. fucked up because that could happen. And that does scare me, but it doesn't hook me in quite the same way. But then as I say that, there are so many films that you're covering in this series from filmmakers that I love and sometimes people do great twists on that genre that really elevate it. So something like Mike Flanagan's Hush, where it has this great oh. conceit of she's deaf and she can't hear the guy coming and how is she going to navigate that is brilliant. And yes, you know, even things like, obviously, as we're recording this, No One Will Save You just came out, which, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not totally head over heels for it in the way that a lot of people are, but that being like, oh, it's home invasion, but with aliens. Or like Corin Hardy's The Hallow, where it's like, it's home invasion, but with little ghoulie goblin guys. There are twists yeah, on it that, that yeah. do kind of hold my imagination a little bit more than something like The Strangers is just a bit bleak and gnarly for me. <laughs> <laughs> agreed, agreed. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. I think what's been really fun is that aside from the traditional home invasion movies, The Strangers and whatever, like it's been really fun to kind of explore those movies that are like twists on the subgenre, including actually the two movies that we're going to talk about today. I think they they have real fun with kind of playing with the idea of the subgenres and what the home invasion is and and what you're expecting, you know, and who are the real invaders and the invadees and who's worse and those kind of movies are the ones I find kind of interesting. Yeah, um, have you ever? I, I've been asking everyone this just out of interest because I think the other thing about it is that for so many people it's such a real visceral threat and I think that's what makes it so frightening, right? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Have you ever had a break in or an invasion in your own home? Yeah, we have, and thankfully neither of us, me nor my now wife were in at the time but uh i can i don't know the date but whatever day lord released green lights is the day okay that we yeah. got burgled because i was coming home from work lord had just released that song it is an absolute 10 out of 10 banger i listened to it like five or six times on the way home because yes. that's just who i am as a person <laughs> i was like all hyped up and then i got off the bus and i remember walking towards the house and seeing that there was a light on, and I was like, I don't think I left a light on. And walking up to the house and seeing that we basically had these like French doors, these like sort of full size glass doors, and one of them had just been smashed. They'd gone in and they had taken basically anything electronic in the house. Thankfully, nothing of real like emotional value or even particularly of massive financial value but it was just all little like gadgety bits and um yeah the feeling that somebody had been in there and taken all our stuff someone took my little remote controlled bb8 how dare they oh for god's <laughs> sake for it goodness just sake it. they were like this is mine you're coming home with me yeah um, it, it was a yeah it was an upsetting feeling that obviously somebody had had broken in and had taken stuff that was ours and then we like really clamped down on sort of security stuff we basically built giant shutters over those doors that until we lived until we moved out of there we kept those up because it was like it just feels really vulnerable so it is it is a horrible experience and it almost ruined green light for me thankfully nothing could ruin that <laughs> good good that's all right then but it is yeah i think that's the thing it's that invasion of your own personal space isn't it and like knowing that people have been in your home you know is is a horrible, horrible thing. I think that's what makes this subgenre so scary. But um, I'm glad that it was okay ultimately for you in terms of like nothing too horrific was taken. And at least you guys, in a way, it's better that you weren't there, right? You yeah. know, like, um, do you know you what? Know. It, as well, it was always the thing that scared me as a kid and even now. Like, I used to wake up so many nights as a kid and be obsessed with the idea that somebody was in the house that I was like really listening yeah. at night of like, someone's in the kitchen i know someone's in the kitchen oh, and no one's there and no. i still find now if i'm really stressed with work or if i've just taken on too much stuff the way it manifests is i wake up in the night and i'm like shit i left a window open or is that yeah. someone inside the house is like the first thing my brain still goes to as an adult. oh god it's such a scary it is it's just like an inherent stress and fear isn't it i think that we all have so there you go um all right well let's get into it luckily these movies are quite fun i think you know they're not your classic home bleak home invasion movie um i can't wait to hear your thoughts on them ben so let's begin we'll, we'll, we'll start off by talking about housebound uh, from 2014 directed by gerard johnston your client has been through a number of these treatment programs in the past and the results have been less than spectacular <laughs> miss 
Ragdoll is in need of stability. I'm therefore ordering an urgent report into the suitability of a mother's house for a sentence of eight months home detention. Gosh, that's high tech, isn't it? Aren't you lucky, Kylie, having all that fancy technology on your foot? Nice being back home. Some things have happened since I've been here. Things I can't explain. Okay, so uh, in New Zealand, Kylie is caught up in some bad things. She's on drugs. She, with her crime partner, partner in crime, uh, tries to rob an ATM. It goes wrong. She ends up slapped with a like home bracelet. What do they? What do they? Yeah, call house it? arrest. Yeah, house arrest. She's mm. under house arrest, uh, and so she is forced to go back to her mum's house under house arrest. Her mum has always had the idea that their house is haunted. And so over the course of this house arrest, Kylie starts experiencing strange things in the house, starts to believe her for herself that something is up. And over the course of the film, it turns out to not quite be what you expect. Do we do spoilers in these synopses? I mean, that's fine. That's fine for now, but we will get into it, of course. And actually, I think what's interesting, right? I realise kind of when deciding to cover this it's kind of a spoiler that I've put it in a home invasion season, right? And not like a ghost haunted house season. Um, but, uh, but Ben, what what were your experiences of watching this film? How much did you know going in and, and what did you think of it? I knew nothing about this going in because I think both the films you've chosen for this episode are things that didn't seem to get a huge release necessarily here. So no. even though I feel like I'm relatively on it with my horror stuff, I'd seen neither of these films before recording this episode well Mm -hmm. obviously i've seen them now and so it was a really fun experience i was watching it thinking like i'm intrigued of why mike chose this for home invasion this feels like a haunted house thing but obviously it still has when you think it is maybe a ghostly element that's at play you do have that thing of like oh it's about her being in the house it's about being trapped in the house and they make that nice connection that like oh the ghost is trapped in the house as well that it's still you know, what is happening in the house is a manifestation of the character's, you know, emotional state. So that makes sense. And then as it kicked into the final act, I was like, okay, this is it. This is why Mike chose this for, <laughs> yes. uh, for the home invasion. So, But it had me, you know, I wasn't there going like, oh, I'm expecting the other shoe to drop. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a fun ride, you know, seeing where this goes. And it's part of that, you know, mid 2010s kiwi cinema like riley funny yeah but also in this lineage of kiwi horror movies with some really splatty effects which is yes. always a wonderful thing so yeah it, it was a good it was a good time yeah i really enjoy this movie as well actually it was only the second time i'd watched it um and i remember absolutely loving it when it first came out it because it, it does have that really fun kiwi horror vibe where it's kind of wacky and it's funny and it's silly but it's also quite scary when it wants to be it's quite nasty and mean mm-hmm. when it wants to be as well and it's got that kind of really fun mix i think and then i really loved the reveal if anything i think for me my favorite stuff is that final act where it where we kind of discover what's really going on and this person is living in the walls. There's a kind of section in the middle that dips a bit for me where there's a lot of kind of investigating and stuff and I would have rather got to the more fun, like, wall person stuff, like, a bit sooner, you know? <laughs> well, that was my other thought. I was like, has Mike chosen this film for when I'm on? Because this is basically fucked up in Canto. Like, there's yeah. a man living in the walls. We don't talk oh about my Eugene. God. <laughs> I had not thought of that, but it's kind of perfect. Yes, that is kind of perfect <laughs> but yeah I, I agree with you i think it's a little bit long it's an hour it's and a 50. bit long it's isn't a it? little bit long mm. and obviously where it's going you know it needs a little bit of road to get there there was a point where when she suspects the neighbor and she goes into the neighbor's house and she's trying to get the uh, retainer out of his mouth yeah and i was like this this is fun but this whole subplot could just go but that is kind of leading you towards towards what the ultimate reveal is going to be. So yeah. I don't quite know how you parry that. I still had fun, but yeah, it could, it's just a, just a couple of trims. Yeah, it really, it really takes you on a journey. And I think it is having so much fun with that idea of like, okay, so we start off with this story of this girl robbing an ATM. What is this? Where's this going to go? And then it becomes this house arrest story. And then it becomes this haunted house story. And then it becomes this, oh, there's a na- there's a murderer maybe living next door. And is there a body buried somewhere in the house? And, and then it becomes like... And 
and I think it's it's having so much fun with all those twists and turns. So it does pack a lot in to its one hour fifty, doesn't it? But I think. Yeah, for me, there are certain elements of this movie that work better than others, and I would have maybe loved to have stripped it down a little bit here and there, you know. Um, but overall, it's a really good time. And I think this is one of the things that's been really fun, because Home Invasion is kind of a re- weird kind of slippery subgenre. And, you know, unless you only talk about the real kind of vintage Home Invasion movies like The Strangers and Funny Games, you're going to come in, run into all of these other movies that kind of border on other stuff. So there are a lot of home invasion movies that are kind of slasher movies and this is of course uh, a home invasion movie that is right on the cusp of being a haunted house film right i mean johnston was inspired to create this movie based on classic movies that he loved like the changeling and the legend of hell house there are some direct nods obviously to the shining in this film so first and foremost this film plays out like a haunted house movie but of course then it has some fun twisting those subgenres and it does in fact turn out to be a home invasion and that's the real fun i think in home invasion is that it does cross over with these other subgenres you know yeah and some of the scares in that arena when you still think it's going to be supernatural are so well done you're asking if this is scary when Mm. kylie goes down to the basement for more or less the first time you get that great moment when the jesus statue falls on her um and that was really well done (laughs) and and then she goes jesus which did crack me up but then you have that great shot when you're like oh her ankle bracelet is gonna start kicking off because she's down in the basement and you just have that shot of her leg and then the hand popping out so well done at that point i'm going they've really like quite literally played their hand too soon i've yes there's a ghost <laughs> yes. i've seen that hand emerge there's a horrible spooky ghost hand yeah obviously then they do actually a great job of holding back the bigger reveal of who and what that actually is until later on but yeah some really effective scares i i, I yeah i do get the sense that maybe this is a bit long because gerard johnson the writer director who obviously made megan this year as well and that's yeah. really fun and, and kind of horror comedy he's just having so much fun getting to lean into all of these different subgenres along the way that he's like oh but but if i do this i get to do like 15 minutes of this kind of genre right and i, I respect him for that even the way that it juggles all of the different characters because you, you like suddenly it's like by the midway point it's like we've got a new main character almost this kind of like ghost hunter paranormal investigator guy like i don't know like the way in which it kind of meanders around and I mean that in a positive way like I think it is really fun the first time you watch it but again it kind of really takes you he, Gerard Johnson is just having a real fun time I think taking us on that journey isn't he I think with all those twists and yeah, turns you can feel sure. that maybe when they were coming up they were like oh and we could do this and we could do this yeah. and <laughs> yeah. again in a nice way they were like let's just do it all anyway because yeah. you know this might be the it, it might be the only film we make it had a bit of that feeling to it because it's that kind of quite low, low key lo-fi kiwi comedy horror who knows if we'll make another movie yeah let's just put all the good stuff in this one yeah are you like how do you i mean obviously this is a massive massive generalization to make but kiwi cinema in general you you know like it's a I, i find it like always there's there's always something about it that i absolutely love and kind of warm to whenever i sink into i remember this came out around the same time as uh hunt for the wilder people i think it's even got you know some of the same shares some of the same cast members right yeah um and Kiwi Horror, as you've already mentioned, also has its own very specific flavour, thinking of those kind of Peter Jackson movies and that kind of thing. But yeah, what are your, are you a fan generally of kind of Kiwi cinema and Kiwi Horror? I mean, I can't profess to go particularly deep on it. And when I say I like Kiwi comedies, basically what I mean is I like Taika Waititi. Yeah, <laughs> but I do absolutely. like Taika Waititi. And yeah, the fact that this came out around the same time as, as Hunt for the Wilder People. And I love, uh, especially some of his early stuff like Boy, I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I it has just a fun laid back tone. The humor is really funny but also very dry and very kind of low key. And I think what really helps with even something like Housebound, that like a part of the gag in what we do in the shadows is the mundanity of it. That like right. Hollywood is all the way over there. This is this is rural New Zealand. This is or even urban New Zealand is relatively sleepy. Things don't happen here the way they do in the movies exactly and they get to like play with that trope and you feel that in something like what we do in the shadows and you feel that in housebound as well even the like Mm. the skepticism around a ghost thing it's like that just wouldn't would that happen do ghosts exist in new zealand (laughs) Uh, yes that feels like a thing and then the way that it does go of it is basically very mundane it's like this 
creepy guy who murdered somebody decades ago and the final scrap is like people just scrapping around with kitchen utensils Mm -hmm. again feels like part of that kind of smaller localized kiwi mindset i think it really lends itself to this kind of film yeah i think you're absolutely right i think there's that feeling of like you said they're so far away from america and this kind of thing and that is something that the humor plays on so much i think in new zealand stuff like even flight of the concords right all of those kind of like taika waititi like you say um what we do in the shadows that idea that everything there is like just a little bit a little bit behind as well like like maybe they were about a decade behind like there's always these kind of running jokes right about how they're just like a little bit behind the times everything moves a little bit slower down there but also there's this kind of warmth and innocence i think to the characters too isn't there I, which i really love and when they mix that with really kind of grisly horror i think it's a really fun weird mix you know i think that's why it works really well even stuff in this where it's like wait when is this set they've got dial-up internet and a big old like yes. clunky desktop computer <laughs> but you're like oh no when she's like, is that one of those iPhones, Kylie? <laughs> like, all of that, it's so good. That's a flash phone, Kylie. Is that one of those iPhones? No. It's flash, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. I love it. They, again, it's like, it's such a fun way, I think, of kind of really giving a, a lot of kind of this New Zealand made stuff a really distinct feel and vibe and very, very different to Australian horror. We talked a lot about Australian horror in the past and how that is you know, that really plays to the kind of the danger of the landscape, mm-hmm. I suppose. And it's they're always these brutal, hot, sweaty, quite nasty movies, often bleak. quite violent and bleak. Bleak Australian horror. Absolutely. It's it tends to be quite relentless and bleak. And 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 yes, the, the, this is kind of your classic New Zealand horror, which is like it's it's nasty. It's not afraid to get nasty and grisly, but there's a bit of warmth and there's a bit of heart and there are some laughs to be had along the way as well, which I really love. Yeah. Um, and what? And speaking of, what do you think of of this cast then? Because you've got, I suppose, our main two characters initially of Kylie and her mum Miriam, right? And then a kind of other additional new interesting characters come into it throughout. But what do you think of uh, the 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 incredible ensemble of characters that we get in this? Yeah. I, I, if anything, I, I think there's slightly too many characters in this it it's part of the like oh we're going in this direction then we're going in that direction that then you have this mm-hmm. like pile up of secondary characters but i think morgana o'reilly is is generally really good as kylie she's likably unlikable like that character has to be quite a bit of a dick for most of the film she is a bit of a dick isn't she yeah yeah and they pay that off at the end in you know eugene's like collection of pictures that he's drawn of like actually all these really difficult things that happened to her as a kid it feels like it's part of the character characterization that she yes. is you know a bit of a troubled individual and she's been through a lot but also she she gives as good as she gets because of everything that she's been through but you never feel yourself going oh fuck this character you know you, you're kind yes. of on side with yes. her um i don't think i'd seen her in anything else but i, th- I thought she was you know really good at anchoring this film uh it's the mother miriam who is the kind of main crossover with Hunt for the Wilder People. Yes. I'm sorry if I'm getting this pronunciation right, but the actress is uh, Rima Te Wiata, mm-hmm. and she is so, so funny. And she gets loads of the funniest lines and all the funny little inter- interjections. And her characterization with Kylie kind of makes this film, because that is part of the texture of it, is like you're not just under house arrest you're under house arrest with your mum yeah. and your stepdad who you don't really know and you don't really like and the inherent awkwardness of like having to go and ba- live back with your parents for nine months let alone with all that spooky stuff happening in the yes, house yes their exactly. friction together brings so many of the laughs and kind of aids the scares as well i think it's so good i i love her and and again if anything that is the film loses me a little bit in that middle section when she suddenly takes a slight back seat, I think, right? You know, like she's 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 very prevalent in that first act and then again at the end. And I miss her when she's not on screen because she's so funny. She's got that brilliant warmth. They've got that mother-daughter antagonistic relationship, but obviously there is love there too. And And also this is this, in some ways you could look at it initially as this story of this home invasion that uh, that Miriam is experiencing, right, of her daughter invading her space using the television so she can't watch her Coronation Street episodes. Coronation and all of this. Street. 
<laughs> is curry a big thing in New Zealand or the way that, I don't know, I'm not conflating New Zealand and Australia, but obviously Neighbours and Home and Away are a big deal here. Is curry a big deal over there? Maybe. I have no idea. I love it. I love that she wants to watch curry over there. And like again, like that is, you, you start off with these very everyday invasion scenarios right of like she does not want her daughter there she's they're stuck together under the same roof for however many months and it's like it's pure hell for them both she used to run a b and b actually i thought about doing that myself with the place at one time you were gonna run a b and b i have wanted to do other things with my life besides put up with your nonsense who would want a holiday in bullford we live on the twin coast highway kylie lots of tourists drive through here yeah at warp fucking speed and I love Graham as well, the the stepdad. Yes, I know. And I was so shocked when Graham got stabbed. And again, that's a really brutal moment that has that little bit of slightly kinetic comedy, the way that the blood is kind of cartoonishly squirting yes. out of him. But at the same time, you're like, oh, not Graham. Graham's innocent in all this. Leave Graham out of this. Yes, agreed. So, so much of the film obviously takes place within the walls of this house. And obviously this is so in- important to all home invasion movies that take place predominantly in the home what do you think of the house in this particular movie and the way in which it's designed the way it looks and the way Gerard Johnson kind of like navigates the space in this house yeah generally great I think the house has a real atmosphere to it you can feel just how cluttered with just random shit it is yes which again becomes a plot point of like oh when they moved in all of the stuff that was already in the house when it used to be a halfway home Mm. is still there they never really cleared anything out you feel that, you know, all the surfaces like feel like they'd be a bit dusty or a little bit yes. grimy or just full of stuff that is like, what even is that? Yes. Um, and you, but you also feel that the house is like a bit too big for them. They're kind of rattling around in this house that's bigger than what they need. Mm. And mm-hmm. so then it's believable that it has all of these secret spaces and all of these little nooks and crannies that you might not even have explored even when you live there. And, you know, which is really important for that ultimate reveal of Eugene in the walls. It's just, you know, any house like this that's full of corners and compartments and bits of shadows. I love that gag where, like, that little creaky uh, cupboard door that creaks open and Kylie's like, fuck this, she just like takes yes. it off the hinges, takes the door off, but then inside there, there's an even tinier door that is also creaking and opening. And I was like, this stuff is just oh, really so playful good. and fun. So good, isn't it? Yeah, I love it too. I love that it's this, what starts off again in that very kind of New Zealand horror way of feeling quite mundane and a bit like, like you say, everything feels a little bit behind the times. There's like an avocado bathroom suite, and like that kind of thing, right? <laughs> uh, the TVs that look like you've got to kind of hit them on top in order to get signal and that kind of thing, right? And, uh, and then, yeah, the more you explore these different rooms, the basement, it does get kind of creepier. And then, like, discovering that there are these kind of secret passageways and spaces between the walls, I think that's all done really well. Because I think Gerard Johnson never really gives you a full indication of what the geography is in the space. Like, it's, I'm never quite sure where rooms are in relation to each other in this house. But I think that kind of feels deliberate, right? It's kind of meant to be this quite vast, like you say, it's almost too big for this family, isn't it, I think? Yeah, it's like the opposite of the start of The Conjuring where James Wan gives you that incredible like I'm just going to walk you around the whole house I'm going to show you all the spooky corners and then you know where all the things are going to go boo and we're going to have some fun with that it's the opposite of that yeah Yeah, you're going to see just like pieces of this house and then you're going to go oh what I thought was the house is actually just a small portion of it but I think one of the things it gets so right is the spooky uh, wallpaper I think spooky wallpaper is such an important thing. And it just really reminded me that kind of intensely patterned, quite darkly coloured wallpaper was almost very like Haunted Mansion feeling. It should have, you know, a bit of that Haunted Mansion, Crimson Peak, just, Mm -hmm. you know, feels off because it's like that's such an intense, dark foreboding you know bit of bit of setting bit of scenery yeah you're right actually there is something about wallpapers right because the shining is such a perfect example of that too right Mm. like patterned carpet and patterned wallpaper 
there's something about like the there's something jarring about it. like I think those jarring combinations of colors and patterns in a space just makes everything feel a bit off straight away, doesn't it? I think you know yeah, it feels oppressive. You yeah. feel like it's, the walls are closing in on you already. Or and then you can have like peeling wallpaper, like rotting wallpaper. Oh. It can be covering over things. Mm. It's all you need as a horror director. I love it, and and of course a basement, and like you've already talked about that great moment in the basement with the Jesus statue in the sheet. Any any time you have statues or any pieces of furniture with sheets over them always great as well right like yeah yeah, you're on to a winner with that stuff it's so good yeah um and there's this whole backstory that's uncovered right about how it was a kind of halfway house and all of this right and and then it goes into this more kind of procedural kind of story i suppose this kind of like ghost hunting slash procedural element where they're finding out the history of this house and uncovering these kind of secret hidden crimes that were committed um and that's when as you've mentioned the kind of the next door neighbor comes into it and everything what do you think of that kind of section of the film where it kind of expands on this mythology and these characters I think it's really cool that the film shifts in a direction that you're not expecting. Mm. It maybe slightly lost me at points there because at that point it hasn't played its full hand yet. You're still going, okay, this is a supernatural ghostly drama. And yes, we expect a bit of backstory of like why this ghost is here, what the ghost is. But when it goes into that level of detail, I'm like... I don't think I need to know all of this backstory. This feels like quite an extraneous amount of ins and outs of like what this was and who was there. And so I Mm. think I maybe, I don't know if it's the film or if it's me, but I kind of, you know, glossed over, my eyes glossed over a little bit when it started to go Mm. a bit more deeply into the like, well, it used to be this and this person did this to this person. So maybe on a rewatch that would stand out a bit more. But all of those things for me feel like it's just set up to get you where you need to be at the end and the end is fun exactly but that setup wasn't the kind of i don't know most entertaining part of the film for me absolutely and it's a film that really takes you on a journey doesn't it that first time you're watching it and i think yeah i think it maybe could have got to the final act a little bit quicker but the first time you watch it you're kind of you are taking in everything that all these characters are saying right you're building up this backstory this is where we first start to learn about this character of eugene who used to live in this house when it was a halfway house um he was very good with machinery but he was afraid of going outside he was maybe a bit strange maybe a bit dangerous and that is all, of course, setting us up for the final act. Now, I'm no Joe Dates myself, but this kid was really fucking strange. He never said more than three words, never looked you in the eye, and never ate off a plate. He had a gift. He loved mechanical stuff. Didn't matter whether it was a motor or a circuit board. He'd figure out a way to make it go. And me being a bloke that had a lot of stuff that needed fixing, I thought... Shit, maybe this could work out. Didn't matter whether it was a car engine or a toasty oven. He'd pull it apart and reassemble it again bit by bit, sometimes adding his own twist. Eugenized. That's what I used to call it. And so this is, of course, when we get the reveal that Eugene, this weird guy, potentially dangerous guy who's very good with electrical devices, has been living in this house the whole time. It was never a ghost. All of these strange occurrences that have been happening in the house all these years are actually because there is a man living in the walls, right? And uh, it's a really, really fun reveal. Uh, This is where it becomes a home invasion movie, a wall person movie, right? What did you think of this reveal? Yeah, it's really fun and I wasn't expecting it, despite, as I say, it being basically the plot of Encanto. Um, Yeah. And the whole (laughs) Eugene element is just... An interesting one because it plays in so many directions. Like Eugene can be scary. You get some scares with Mm. Eugene. Oh, yeah. There's also a lot of pathos for Eugene. By the end of the film, you're like, oh, he's just this like lonely guy and he didn't want to leave. And obviously they keep him living in the house at the end of the movie. That's part of the sort of final reveal. So they want to build some of that like emotional connection to Eugene. At the same time, he looks straight up goofy. And uh, he looks like yes. the invader from Home Alone who isn't Joe Pesci. Uh, yes, he looks like Daniel Stern. Yes. Yeah, I kept thinking that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that... Obviously, we're going to talk about Home Alone a lot in the next yeah. movie too. But I didn't know if that almost felt deliberate because he does look freakishly like that character, Marv, quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. and obviously with just the comedy leanings of this anyway, he almost looks a bit like, I don't know, a Mighty Boosh character or something like yeah. that as well, where it's like... Yeah. I. 
they do a good job of getting some scares out of him, but also when they have him just like sitting in relative daylight, kind of explaining things or talking to them, it's like he's he's just covered in like white makeup. And I get that they're going for he's very pale. He almost is a ghost in the house. It's, you could say, yeah. I don't know, is this if we're throwing another genre in the mix, is this like a gothic film where it's like, oh, there is there's a, a metaphysical yeah. ghost who's actually, you know, this person living in the walls of the house. Uh, you could you could maybe apply that to this, but yeah, yeah. Eugene, he just he just looks funny. There are moments where I was like laughing at Eugene, and I was like, they're managing to do a lot of different tones and shades with this weird guy living in the walls yeah. of the house. Yeah, I think it's genius actually the way in which this film balances all those tones, and it, it and, and that's embodied in the character of Eugene, who is like exactly as you said, kind of sort of quite scary but also goofy and funny and cartoony all at the same time which is exactly what this film kind of is I think right and he's he's kind of a perfect kind of personification of that I love that and I love this I, I love these kind of films where you have like secret rooms hidden within houses and this kind of thing and, and, and I think it's a really fun reveal there's almost like a sub 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 genre of these home invasions which is like the wall person movie yeah I mean it's such that is such a spooky idea there's something intense about the home invasion element of like somebody is actively now trying to get in your house with a weapon that feels very urgent and very danger fueled but it's a different flavor of like someone is living in your house who you don't know about and they are like creeping around without you knowing they're there and coming in and taking stuff yeah that is such a, a deeply unsettling idea um that it's it yeah an interesting flavor of home invasion that isn't it's the slow invasion the invasion has happened you just yeah. don't know it yet yeah that idea of the person is in the house with you and they have been all along it's always a really fun twist i think it's something very creepy about it and i think this is also just when the film goes really fun like balls to the wall fun where we've got the reveal of um dennis as the villain right the big bad as well and i love dennis because of course he starts off as this sort of psych what, what is he? he's like a counselor he, type character initially he's a clinical psychologist and i picked up on that because yeah. my wife is a clinical psychologist oh, and it's amazing. always the twist is like the psychologist is mad the psychologist is the villain <laughs> and yeah very specifically clinical psychologist i wonder if he did a three-year doctorate uh, to, to qualify for that position uh, I'd love a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of backstory in this film, but maybe a little bit of Dennis backstory on how he <laughs> got into yeah. this role. Uh, yeah, he's a fun character because you kind of, again, it's the how the film is like distracting your attention. It's kind of waving one hand over here and in the background, mm -hmm. Dennis is there and you go, oh, he is being a bit creepy and he is being, you know, he's got a weird interest in what Kylie is doing um, yeah. and in what's happening in the house. I think that is... A fun reveal, and especially, I mean, what they do to him at the end. I I loved that they exploded Dennis's head. Yes, pop that noggin. Do it. Incredible, incredible. And you're right, it kind of it drops these hints. Like there's that moment when all the lights go out and then Dennis is attacked, right, by Eugene. And, and it d never really occurred to me, like, why is it Dennis specifically that's being attacked here by Eugene? It's because Eugene is actually trying to protect them all, right? And, uh, and I love that he starts off as this fairly unassuming, you know, psychologist. And then when the when the reveal starts to kick in, like when he removes his dentures, suddenly he, he becomes <laughs> very, very quickly just very grotesque and horrible, doesn't he? Like, yes. it's so funny the way in which, I don't know, the way in which Gerard Johnston just kind of like frames him and lights him and he gets kind of sweaty and just all around a little bit more grotesque instantly from that moment doesn't he he's, he's yeah, just both in like general demeanor and in physical embodiment he just becomes like slimier he just yes. becomes this horrible <laughs> slimy guy <laughs> yeah cameron rhodes is the actor there i think he does a great job of you know playing it cool when he needs to and then everybody dials into the insanity by the end of this film so uh, good. which I, I love that as well when you know you can crank up the scares and crank up the humor and crank up the gore yeah. and just go for broke. I love the feeling of a horror film, you know, having done the things that need it needs to do, just like putting its foot on the gas and just being like, right, it's a speed to the finish. Yes. We're going to go bonkers for 20 minutes. 
hold on. I love that feeling of acceleration. You get it in that moment when he takes the dentures out. It goes deranged in the same way that, yeah, like some great New Zealand, like Peter Jackson's Brain Dead goes, where it just goes absolutely fucking mental in its final act. And this movie basically does that. It goes full like The Shining when he's breaking through the bathroom door and he's sticking his head through the gap. And, you know, like, and it just seems to go on and on and get more and more deranged up to that beautifully crescendoed moment as you mentioned there when his head explodes <laughs> and and our two main characters just get blood splattered all over though it's just brilliant isn't it the so blood fun. splat is great and then the the shot again of his uh he- head or his body without a head and you just get those kind of spurts of those cartoonish spurts of blood coming up i just feel like i you know there's a real intention of the camera there to like we're just gonna rejoice in this image for a few seconds but even the shining moment as you say when he's like trying to come in through the door Mm. he's awkwardly using a weird little like (laughs) circular handsaw thing so again (laughs) it feels like that kiwi undercutting of the horror tropes that like it's not diminishing his you know ability in terms of like once he gets in that room he is going to kill him Mm -hmm. but the fact that like he doesn't have an axe, he can't do the, he can't you know be slick and Hollywood about it. He's awkwardly using this weird little saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, felt like a, a very you know intentioned moment as well. Yeah, really fun. Um, and so finally, I was going to finish on talking about Gerard Johnston and what he's done next because it's really interesting because he did. It felt like he had quite a big old gap there before he kind of returned. I mean, literally his next film after Housebound was Megan, 2022's Megan, right? One of the most kind of talked about horror movies of last year i feel like do you think now you've seen both can you see that connection can you feel that th- they're made by the same guy do you think yeah i mean i started watching housebound not realizing that it was him yeah and so again it kind of clicked things into place a bit when i realized that and thought oh do you know what it actually made me also appreciate with megan that you know i think akila cooper i think akila cooper did a great job of bringing a lot of the tone that she brings to her projects in that film. But also it really made sense that it was him, that he is happy to like dial into the sublime and the ridiculous and bring some scares and bring a lot of laughs. It made me want to watch the unrated Megan cuts. It made me want the like bloody gorier version of Megan because seeing how much he clearly delights Mm -hmm. in the gore and the splatter here was like that's the thing that is missing from the theatrical cut of of Megan as I've seen it at the moment yeah completely agree completely agree yeah it made me wonder like where where had he been in those years in between right and and I hope for his sake that in the wake of Megan he gets to do more cool things because i think this is a really strong start this double bill and to feel the sensibilities that carry through especially that just general comedic horror tone but obviously having gone from like very low budget kiwi film to moderately budgeted hollywood movie you know uh, that's that's still a bit of a leap yeah. And you still feel his fingerprints on both. So yeah. yeah, completely agree. I think it's a very hard thing to get that kind of balance of comedy and horror correct. For me, Megan went a little bit more into comedy than I wanted it to. Like, I think, again, like like you said, it's maybe I was missing that X-rated version of it, that kind of slightly more uh, bloody, gory, nasty version of it. Um, but uh, but I think that kind of balance is really nailed in, in Housebound, particularly. And yeah, I can't wait to see what he does next. Like, I hope he continues making these odd, quirky, freaky, funny horror movies. Yeah, really, and clearly really going, great. like, what if this genre did this for a bit that also feels like part of the twist uh, of what he puts on things and like anyone who's willing to play that can lead to some really fun stuff as an audience member of just yeah not knowing exactly where you're going to go next love it love it so there you go so housebound now that you've seen it do you think it's a movie you would recommend to people i would yeah definitely people Mm. who you know like this kind of comedic horror and who could be in a similar position as me and watch it not knowing necessarily even what this film is and letting it just unfold it's a really fun ride uh i I think having something that's a horror film that is yeah a fun experience to watch beyond just being like oh it's really gnarly is always an easy recommend to people around this time of year to be like oh if you want to watch a fun horror film that's gonna like catch you off guard and but you're gonna have a good time you're gonna feel generally good coming out of it 
this absolutely fits that bill. Yeah, completely agree. It's perfect for this kind of spooky season, actually, isn't it? It is. It's one of those really kind of fun horror movies that you can pop on with friends. My wife loved this movie, actually. Like, there's been very few movies of the, this home invasion season that she's wanted to sit down and watch with me. <laughs> and when I said, oh, I've got to rewatch Housebound tonight, she was like, oh, great, I'll watch that with you. And it's like, because she r- loved it first time round and really enjoyed it. So I think it it particularly maybe appeals to the people that are not as diehard into horror maybe or or into the more kind of nasty horror um you know because it's it's slightly more on the periphery there isn't it i think you know? That was a little clip you just heard there from uh, arguably one of the greatest performances in horror history. That was Isabella Gianni from Possession, the absolutely bonkers film from 1981. And that is one of the many, many fantastic performances that we are going to be discussing in our big Patreon poll. We asked everyone on Patreon, all 1,500 members, to vote for their top 10 horror movie performances of all time. Uh, And we have now collated the results, thanks to the help of brilliant listener and patron Tony Ware, who collated the results for me. Thank you so much, Tony. We now have our final countdown, and we We are going to be counting down the top 50 performances of all time in the horror genre as voted for by patrons. It's going to be a spectacular two episode event and we are going to be airing that very, very soon over on Patreon. So if you want to hear what people voted as the greatest horror performance of all time, and I will say, spoiler alert, Isabella Gianni is pretty high on that list, then you must sign up to our Patreon and check it out. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Five dollars per month will get you access to that exclusive countdown. You'll also get things like Fresh Blood, where we review new releases every month. Or you can go up to ten dollars per month, where you will get exclusive access to our retrospectives, our mini seasons. Uh, we recently did a whole Halloween franchise retrospective uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Everybody who signs up also gets a little shout out on the main podcast as a thank you speaking of i'm going to give everybody who signed up in the month of september a little thanks so a big thank you to trisha joanna wilson robert cuffley hardly 666 gary mckenzie stephanie vaughan pooh bear uh, anna wonderlich uh, matt ackerman emma arneal scout mark fluter for my devil jesse mckellen hannah hemsley brown jennifer lynch erin spence amanda russell Stuart campbell susan barrett Catherine keating vicky p patrick hunt Donna Eason, Henry, Ben, Joseph Donahue, Claire Inez Martin, Carla Mallette, Jesse Ellenberger, Anna, Julia Blackwell, Jennifer Elizardo, uh, Anthony Santana, Hayden Story, Catherine, Natalie Panmanathan, uh, Jennifer Curtis, Laura Quinn, Le Ward, Jeff Mullins, Muddit Sharma, John Kelly, Alex, Anne Hillsborough, Sharissa Carfrey, Marguerite Campbell, Hilary Emmons, James Lelou, Kelsey Plank, Jenny McCowan, Kieran Iscriado, Simone Miller, Rich Stone, Miles Olson, Hack Burton, Mr. Mayhem, Slights of Heart, Ted Kirby, Lauren Fitzgibbon, Jonathan Hunter, Haley Spagbowl, Susie, Wilson Emery's McCall, Alejandra Escalante, Sam, Laurie Roussan, Steve Bread, Josephina Matteson, Two Count Kyle, Lauren Ashley, Larry Evans, Lisa Fremont, Jack Elliott, The Nottingham Horror Collective Zine, and Lou Preecy. A huge thank you to all of those people for signing up in the month of September there was a lot of you that signed up in September so thank you so so much for that and one more time if you want to join them and get treated to regular bonus episodes and more then sign up now patreon.com slash evolution of horror that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror Okay, let's head into the second half of this week's episode as Ben Travis and I discuss the bonkers and divisive Better Watch Out from 2016. Want to put her in the mood? Watch a horror movie. Dude, she's like twice our age. I really don't think it's going to happen. She's here. You are breathtaking. (laughs) Thank you. Now don't stay up and watch scary movies, okay? It'll give you nightmares again. So what do you want to do? 
Ricky, why can't you just leave me alone? He's such a jerk. Don't hang up on me. What was that? Oh my god. Get away from the window. There's someone there. Ashley! Are you hiding? I'll find you. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Better Watch Out, directed by Chris Peckover. Ben, there's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, another one that I knew nothing about this film, and I don't even know when this actually came out in the UK. Uh, I'd, I'd barely even heard of it, and other than, you know, vaguely guessing that because of that title it was a Christmas movie, did not know mm. what to expect. So it is the story of Ashley, who is a babysitter. She is heading to a pretty well-off, suburban american house to babysit for two extraordinarily horny 12 year olds uh primarily luke uh this little kid whose parents are off to some christmasy do mm. and uh so ashley goes around to babysit for him he is hoping he's gonna get a little bit of babysitter action over that evening despite being again 12 years old luke 12 years old mm -hmm. And so over the course of the evening, somebody starts trying to break into the house and Ashley and Luke have to band together to try and survive. And what happens from there is something that really caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah, there is quite the reveal, right? Which we will get to. Um, I am intrigued to know what you thought of this, Ben, because this is a movie that I think does divide people. What, what did you think of Better Watch Out? I don't know what I think of it. I've it's <laughs> divided me. I yeah, you know, was really ha generally having fun watching it, and it's weird tonally, isn't it? Because it is. It is playing quite comedic from the beginning. It is playing in a kind of jokey, jaunty manner. Mm -hmm. But actually, what this film is is really fucked up and uh, gets really dark towards the end, even though it's playing in this intentionally quite like heightened cartoonish space, which is really yes. interesting. So I was expecting more of a romp going in because of the general tone of it. And then what actually happens, where it goes and quite how deep and dark it goes, I was not mm -hmm. expecting. Which, you know, again, is part of the ride, is part of the appeal. Yeah, it does put me off a little bit how nasty it gets because yeah. I think I struggle a bit with nasty horror. And uh, for the first half hour, Mike, I was thinking, do you know what? I felt really let down by Krampus, was not a big Krampus right. fan and wanted a big, you know, super great Christmassy horror movie to become a staple. I was ready mm -hmm. for Krampus to be it. And Krampus was just nasty in a not great way for me. I, I really struggled with that film and felt very disappointed by it. And so here I was going, oh, great, this is it. And then this film got really, really grimy <laughs> in the last 45 <laughs> minutes. But I cannot deny that I was hooked along for the ride and was just constantly going like, what is happening? Yeah. Which, you know, is part of what I watch these things for. It's such a strange, queasy mix, this film. I, I love it. And I defend this movie a lot to people. Mm. And it, it, I think it is really mean. It's a really mean-spirited movie. But I don't know. Uh, if this makes sense, I think it's really mean, but with its heart sort of in the right place. And we'll, we'll talk about this as we go. But I think, and I'm very aware that we're sort of two dudes talking about this, but I think... There are criticisms leveled towards it. And the only criticisms I've ever heard actually leveled towards it have come from other dudes who say that this movie is quite nasty and misogynist. Uh, I think personally that this is a movie sort of about misogyny and about toxic, horrible men more than it is on the side of those characters, you know? Um, so I, I don't kind of mind it going mean and nasty because I think the film is really... It's a really mean, nasty comment on these types of 
male characters or these types of boys more than anything else right um and i think more than anything else as well is that it is it's you know it's like home alone meets funny games right and you know you get <laughs> a really really horrible horrible disturbing upsetting um you know subject matter that is like you're watching you know some sort of torture porn or uh or you know home invasion movie like funny games but it's dressed up in this glossy christmas jumper right and there's something kind of visually fun and tonally fun about it even though it's giving you this really grotesque horrible stuff so it's a really weird mix and i get that it doesn't sit well with certain people but i kind of really dig its vibe it's like just on the right side of being nasty but also quite fun and entertaining for me you know? yeah and it gives you i mean we don't want to go into the ending just yet mm. but it gives you just enough of that Oh, okay. I feel a little bit better about this by the end, by the yeah. end credits. There's just a glimmer of like, okay, thank God, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. um, because up until that point, it's got pretty damn bleak. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's inter- It's always interesting that line, isn't it? Between how much is this obviously condemning the behaviour of the characters and this mindset uh, of Luke the kid and his sort of entitlement around Ashley and his jealousy over her previous relationships. Uh, but obviously then it's Ashley who receives the brunt of that punishment and loses a lot of people along the way. Mm. I've got to be honest, I didn't particularly engage on this on that deeper level, which I'm uh, very much sure is is there and there is a lot that you could kind of debate about the morality of this film. I was just especially watching it for the first time caught up in like what the hell is this movie where am i going what in the macaulay culkin is happening here yeah i know and i think it again it, it's i think it's playing on this kind of film that we got a lot of through the sort of late 90s to the late 2000s you know the 2000s you, you mentioned it earlier it was quite a sort of nasty decade not just in horror but in all genres it was it was quite a mean time in kind of mainstream cinema even when you look at comedies right from the american pie movies to super bad to the hangover these films that were very very Rowy, and they were very like of a certain type of humor with certain types of characters that I think you know in a kind of post book smart world we don't really get comedies like that anymore those kind of like regressive broy films and this movie I feel like is is again it feels like more to me a, a, as a comment on those types of characters that we used to get in those types of movies and it is really riding that fine line because it is a kind of broy comedy about these two horrible boys but I think the point is that it's a horror film about them right it's not portraying them as these kind of like silly hormonal heroes like Jason Biggs is in American Pie it's portraying them as fucking monsters in yeah. this right who you absolutely want to see have the shit kicked out of them by the end because know? even before yeah. where this film ultimately goes for that first half an hour i was there going i get that this is the setup of the film mm. but uh it's playing yeah in a very like fun jaunty tone yeah but i and i mentioned this in the plot setup do you think it's strange that they are literally 12 years old? Because that just felt like, I was just like, who, what the hell, who are these kids? That well, like, yeah. maybe this says more about me, but I think for me as a 12 year old, I was just not even it vaguely in that space yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Until I was like a little bit of an older teenager, you know, of how rampantly horny this, this boy is and what he wants out of this babysitter setup, which again, feels like a bit of a Hollywood trope, isn't it? It's, yes. it's a horror trope and it's the, uh, of just babysitters in general but like a Hollywood movie trope of like oh the kid's first vaguely sexual experience comes from one night with the babysitter which yes. again gen- generally tends to skew in a like male kid female babysitter dynamic which is actually really icky uh, so maybe yeah. it's just trying to like heighten that but it, while the film is like playing in a really fun place it is all about these 12 year olds being like oh do, you're gonna get some tonight oh i hope i like i was like yeah <laughs> who are these kids what okay uh kill fuck mary with the adventure time chicks go fuck princess bubblegum <laughs> what not more celine hell no one she's made of bubblegum so she can like stretch which leads to two her pussy tastes like bubblegum ew dude that means she's all like <laughs> like sticky and moist and shit Dude, those are pros. <laughs> Where'd you learn that? Your mom? No, your sister. 
further, everyone from the Candy Kingdom is ravenous for flesh. So you know she gives legendary head. Yeah, as long as you don't mind cutting gum out of your pews. <laughs> not, that, uh, not that you have to worry about that. Grim. It's absolutely grim. And I, I, I mean, I definitely remember 12-year-olds in my year talking like that, some of them. And there were always some that were more like that than others. And I, I can believe it. And I think it would the film would have had a very, very different kind of tone if they were like 16, 17. I mean, they wouldn't have had a babysitter, I suppose, for a start. So it would have been an entirely different film. But I think, yeah, it lends this extra element of absurdity that I think makes it more watchable, the fact that they are monstrous 12-year-olds and not like... 18 year olds I suppose or whatever you know um yeah so again it adds to that sort of ickiness but also comedy it's again it's a really really weird mix and I kind of admire that it goes there with it you know yeah it's a big <laughs> swing of a paint can of a movie oh, isn't it just and I do have a weakness Ben for Christmas movies generally yeah. like I I am unabashedly a very Christmassy person I am that guy that like first of December gets the tree up and puts Mariah Carey on. Like, I'm yeah, that man. guy. You gotta um, do it. Yeah, so I am all for a good Christmassy film. One of my favourite horror movies of all time is Black Christmas. And I love this kind of, this mix of kind of spooky thrills with Christmas decorations, twinkling lights, snow, Christmas carols and music. And and actually, I really do feel like, like you mentioned this already, like the thing you didn't necessarily get with Krampus. This movie initially gives you such a Christmassy vibe, doesn't it? Like, and it's really playing to it in the first act. It's this really kind of fun, festive, jaunty holiday movie initially, isn't it? You know? Yeah, it really leans into that. The snowy streets, the carol singers, you, you yeah. know, and it feels like, you know, you could put your favourite Christmas jumper on and settle down with a big thing of mulled wine that goes down far too quickly uh, to, to stick this on each year. It really leans into the Christmassy element in a, in a fun way. And I... I guess it's playing into that Home Alone setup, isn't it? It's playing very much on that. Ultimately, where the film goes is not very Christmassy. And even thematically, no. it doesn't really have anything to do with Christmas. But it no. feels like it is just leaning into the Home Alone-ness that we all know, that we've all grown up with that film and, and know what yeah. that kind of setting means. And it gives you a certain sense of expectation, not just of a certain tone but of a certain level of like slapstick consequence free violence yes that then this film completely upends i think absolutely textually well that is another really fun thing about what this film does right and have you are you a fan of home alone ben the home alone movies i, I am i really like the first one mm. uh and there are things about the second one that I really like. The New York setting of Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, yeah. is really fun. Um, John Nugent on the Empire team is like the world's biggest Home Alone 2 head. He is obsessed with that movie for some reason. But the last time I watched it, genuinely the thing I was so disturbed by is the violence. I was like, I, I will happily watch... You know, people get chucked into wood chippers at the end of Evil Dead Rise or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then when Macaulay Culkin is stood on the top of a hotel or like an abandoned building that he has purposefully rigged with traps to right. mess up these burglars, they are not trying to get in his house. Yep. They, he has like set up this whole thing just to mess him up. And he is standing on the roof of that building throwing bricks full force at their heads. Yes. And you feel it bounce. I was watching it just going like, oh, oh my God. They're it's like brains right. would be everywhere. I couldn't handle the dissonance between the insane violence and the complete lack of consequences. Weirdly, <laughs> like made it really uncomfortable for me. Well, this is perfect, actually, you saying that, because this is exactly <laughs> what I think this film plays into. And we actually talked about Home Alone in this Home Invasion series, because I thought partly I think it's a bit of fun to do because it's a in te technically the biggest grossing ever home invasion movie of all time is Home Alone. Yeah. And and it is a home invasion. But I think the other thing that's really interesting about it is that dynamic between violence and comedy and horror. And that you, you know, the the way in which those burglars are treated in Home Alone One and Two is so unbelievably nasty that like you could just <laughs> tip it in a slightly different direction and that would be really really horrible, right? But but obviously it's all framed with funny performances and funny sound effects and you're rooting for Kevin and so it's fine. 
but there is this other context of this film, right, where it's like, Kevin is actually a little psychopath, right? He's, He's really monster. getting off on torturing these people. like, And that, again, is what this film plays into, right? It, you've got this absolute little cunt who is this like <laughs> who is basically kevin McAllister, but it's like yeah. if you frame it slightly differently this is what a monster kevin McAllister actually is right and um and seeing those booby traps where people get shot or the paint cut the paint uh, cans swinging down again framing them in a slightly different context in this movie and you realize just how horrific those home alone movies actually could have been right <laughs> he even orders himself a pizza yes how much more kevin McAllister could it be incredible incredible so uh let's talk about luke our main character, our anti-hero, played by Levy. Is it Levy Miller or Levi Miller? I'm not sure. Um, but it, I think it's a really it's brave performance, right, from this kid. But w- what do you think of this performance and the character of Luke? I mean, he's so unsettling from the off because he does look very young. He does look very boyish, but he is also trying to act a little bit older and seem very slick which seeing kids like acting oh. like adults is really creepy anyway um it's so cringe isn't it because he yeah. was born in 2002 so presumably he must have been at about 13 let's say this was filmed in 2015 if it came out in 2016 so he he's he's, he's about two years older maybe than than his character but not that much older you know so yeah he's very creepy. creepy and he gives a great performance of you know it's it is it's a broad character, but he leans into the nuances mm. of that, of like how to play smarmy and how to play innocence, but innocence with the smarm behind it. If you can see how much it's just put on. Yeah. He is, yeah, very, very good in this film because I hated him from the beginning. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> hated him. He's such a skeezy little horny 12 year old. What a, what a weird kid. Um, and also, I love the fact that they also give him these like fucked up mummy issues as well, like where he has to listen to the, the womb, the womb machine. noises. What? <laughs> Is that a thing? I've never heard that before. I, I think it just adds to the general creepiness of him as a character, mm-hmm. doesn't it? And he is. He's, he's hes a horrible little shit from the minute we first meet him. Um, the way he acts in front of his mate and the way he shows off and then the way he is with the the babysitter and then as he becomes more and more of a villain he does go a little bit bigger and almost a bit more campy doesn't he when he's like walking around with the gun and he's performing and again i think there's a really interesting kind of comment there on like we've seen countless teen movies where young people are the villains like think of any scream movie or teen slasher of the 90s and there's always these moments when the killers reveal themselves and they've got a gun and they're always like, you think of Skeet Ulrich or Matthew Lillard in Scream, and they're always way cooler and more sexy than they should be for a bunch of kids, right? And it's always like, in his head, this kid thinks he's like one of those types of people almost, doesn't he? It's like, it's like he's playing a movie out in his head, but he actually just looks like the biggest dork you've ever seen. You yeah, know? when he's dancing around with the baseball bat and he's doing his little routine yes. and it's like, ooh, ooh, that's, that's yeah. upsetting on many, many levels. Uh, yeah, and the... And, uh. The whole, even just like the dating setup of him and the babysitter and all the schemes that he's got there before you even get into the like horror, horror stuff. Yeah. Is just, it's so, I think, like I said, entitled. The way that he is just like, I am going to fully manipulate the situation and I am just going to turn this thing of like, she is here for a job to make sure that he doesn't get hurt over the course Mm -hmm. of this evening while his parents are out. And he is just going to try and manipulate this whole evening to his own ends it's Mm -hmm. even before you get into the wild age stuff it's just really inappropriate and feels weird and you can tell she's trying to let him down gently she clearly likes him in the sense of she's probably looked after him a lot over the years since he yeah i mean he still is a little kid but since he was an even littler kid and so, you know, she she likes this kid. He's decent enough to babysit. Uh, but then him crossing those boundaries and her having to move within that of like, oh, I've got to let him down gently, mm-hmm. but also I've got to be firm about putting a stop to it. And even that is like part of his game in a way because that's before any of the home invasion stuff has even started yeah it's it's gr- it's really grim and i think um olivia de Jong plays it really well as ashley too i think throughout the whole movie she's brilliant because she's this very like 
absolutely no time for his bullshit from minute one from when she steps into that house all the way through to the point when he essentially kills her and she's tied to a chair she will not entertain him for one second right and there is just this she has this brilliant kind of moral higher ground throughout the whole film where she's just rolling her eyes at the ridiculousness of all of these boys around her right i mean you were saying the weird mummy issues of the yes. Luke character and yeah the weird womb machine he has a little bit of a norman bates around him of just his look absolutely and then there's also this thing of okay this other person comes into his house who is like the older caregiver who is instructed who is allowed to tell him what to do Mm -hmm. and he's like trying to crack on with basically his surrogate mum for the night is there's there's Deeply subtext strange. there there's something going on there that's not like there's a moment right before he kills her or thinks he's killed her right where she says i know why your mum stopped cuddling you or something right she says something like that to him which is like we all know that there's something wrong with you <laughs> essentially even yeah. your mum knows there's something wrong with you you know i remember my mom used to tuck me in i'd hold on to her and never let go She felt so safe. I'd just fall asleep. Then she stopped. I don't know why. And now, I don't sleep well anymore. I know exactly why she stopped. Why? Open your eyes. Ashley, open your eyes. There's very clear, like, sort of triggers for him in a way of that. And the, you're just a little boy, like, you're anything yes. about his age or his youth just sends him over the edge. And he's got his little mate, Garrett, who kind of, like, <sighs> slightly puffs him up, his little sidekick, right? Who, at the beginning, you think, oh, this kid's the bigger dickhead. And actually, mm-hmm. I'm not sure he is really. But uh, again, I love that performance by ed oxenbold as well as this kind of like weakling sidekick who keeps getting like drawn into it you know yeah basically playing t diamond from the visit once again just a couple of years older i expected him oh to break God, out into yes. a rap at any minute holy um, shit do you know what i did not actually put those two together and realize really? that was the same person i kept recognizing him in my head yeah. and he had this kind of like almost mclovin vibe to me right <laughs> and, and uh, but i was trying to place him but yes of course he's yes. the annoying rapper from the, he's the, the visit. little little rapper yeah. Boy, and uh, yeah, again, yes. and, you know, he's good in that capacity, and mm-hmm. the way that he plays off Luke and their evolving relationship over the course of the film, yeah. of how aligned they are at the beginning, and quite quickly, I think, once the rug has been pulled, of how much Garrett is over his head, and that this isn't really what he agreed to, and mm-hmm. he has been friends with this kid for their whole lives it seems and has probably had 12 years of basically being tortured by luke into just getting whatever he wants yes over that time is uh yeah he plays that really well of like he he's just a little douchey boy Mm -hmm. but you understand you feel it when you can tell that he's just like i don't want to do any of this but it feels like it's too late and i feel like i can't say no there's this there's i think there's really interesting like stories that have been told about these types of characters like you're a Buffy fan Ben oh huge Buffy fan it's my favourite show right so you know Warren Jonathan and Andrew right and the trio that the episode, dreaded trio that episode when those boys push things too far and like they take advantage of a woman and it's a really really grim it's one of the most disturbing episodes of Buffy isn't it and yeah. that and th- there's that same kind of dynamic of these like entitled horrible boys who are just like playing their silly games and then suddenly they realize they they're in too deep or they've taken it further than they think they're going to or at least one of them is happy to take it further and then there's the kind of sidekick characters who just kind of go along with it right and there's that same kind of dynamic isn't there i think between luke and garrett they're almost like warren and andrew you know yeah the early years (laughs) yeah and again Um, there's that fun i think there is that kind of fun interesting commentary there on these like 
yeah, these entitled sort of boys who think they deserve more from from the world, almost. You know, um, yeah, uh, I, I think there, I think that's all kind of in there. And then also, even in the other male characters too. So you get her the appearances of her boyfriends that come in, but even early on in the film when we meet Luke's parents. And you've got the mum, played by legend Virginia Madsen, who is uh, obviously our hero from Candyman. And then the dad, played by Patrick Warburton as well, who, like, (laughs) doesn't say much, but the things he does say are weird. And he has a slightly kind of pervy, weird way of talking to Ashley as well, right, as this middle-aged man talking to what must be what a 16 17 year old girl like it's all very creepy from the start yeah and i I mean i was so thrilled to see patrick warburton as i said our last film on disneyversity was the emperor's new groove in which patrick warburton voices the incredible comic genius that is cronk uh and i was in that episode going oh i don't think i've really known patrick warburton from many other things then straight away here we go better watch out here he is uh and yeah he he drops the c-bomb here what a delight somebody please (laughs) animate Kronk dropping the C-bomb to his dialogue from Better Watch Out. Yes, yes. (laughs) But all of these things that you're pointing out, I think it's playing, as you say, on that idea of entitlement, but also that these characters think they're in a movie. They are enacting things that they have grown Mm. up watching, attitudes that they have learned from stories in the 80s and 90s, movies that normalise these actually really creepy behaviours. yeah. Exactly. And I think the I think the Home Alone thing in particular is just like the the key to unlocking the what about these things that are ridiculous in the films? If you play them out for real, it's actually really horrible. Yeah, and that comes out in the attitudes between the characters as well as the actions playing out through the course of the film. Yeah, I think exactly that, and I think the film. That there are other versions of this film that we would have got in the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s where there is an external force, a home invader, and this little boy and his babysitter have to team up and he protects her and he comes out as the hero of the day. That's the movie he wants it to be in his head, right, Luke? And um, and and that's the film we think we're watching initially, right? You think you're in this kind of Halloween-type setup. It's like Halloween, but what if Tommy Jarvis, who Laurie Strode was babysitting, actually turned out to be the monster, <laughs> right, rather than Michael Myers? Because we think there is this outside force, this person breaking into the house, and then you get that reveal 30 minutes in where it's this little boy he's planned the whole thing out what did you think of that reveal i take it you didn't see that coming no i didn't and i thought it was just so bold the fact that that happens 30 minutes into a 90 minute film you just go where is this going now and it, it was the reveal of that that i mean for a moment it was like okay this has been playing on a comic register anyway so then the puncturing of oh it's not a home invader it's garrett pissing around I was then mm. still expecting, okay, it's that's just a bit of a gag. Yes. But there's still some other home invasion thing happening. And actually what the reveal was, was so much darker than that. And I think the thing that really shocked me, it wasn't necessarily the reveal of Garrett in the mask. It was the moment when Luke slaps Ashley and she falls down for the stairs. Oh my God. And she falls down the stairs. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, he's killed her. Yeah. And that was my feeling of like, this is... The story of this is he kills the babysitter. Now what's he going to do? Yes. And then it's even worse. Obviously, she's not dead, which is great. But even worse that like, oh, no, he is a horrible monster beyond just like a kid who, you Mm. know, watched too many films and got some ideas in his head and pulled off a stupid plan and it went wrong. No, he he is like all in on the psychopathy. Yeah. It really caught me off guard. It really catches you off guard. I think it's a really smart twist. But again, I understand that suddenly it becomes a movie that you don't necessarily know that that's what you're in for. And for some people, that's not the movie they necessarily want to see, right? Mm -hmm. Because then it does become a lot harder to watch because we are just watching a girl tied to a chair while these boys do horrible things, basically, to her for the rest of the film, right? That's when it becomes a more like extreme home invasion movie from this point on. Onwards, you know yeah and because it's over yeah. the course of the rest of the film then unpeeling what is actually going on with luke because she wakes up tied to the chair and you go well he's probably just panicked because he's done this insane thing mm-hmm. and then he's like oh if she gets out she's gonna tell somebody and he's only 12 so like maybe he's just panicked because of the situation and then the unfolding of like no he has 
very bad designs for where everything goes from here um and you feel that in obviously his relationship with ashley but also as we said with garrett of garrett just being like whoa this is going deeper and darker Mm -hmm. than he had any idea that it would it's so gross isn't it because like they 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 you know they keep talking about all this sexual stuff there's the moment when the boyfriend comes over and he ends up tied to a chair and at one point luke is like telling them to have sex with each other in front of him and stuff and it's just like it gets darker and, and also you really do feel like you're in a bit of an unsafe movie at this point you're like oh my mm-hmm. god is that gonna happen like because you don't know where this movie is gonna take you next i think you yeah know. not knowing uh, what luke is capable of and the film keeping on pushing the boundaries beyond what you thought Luke was capable of, yes, keeps that suspense because it's not like, oh, I get what this is now and then it's going to maybe struggle to keep that up. It's like, no, we are going to keep pushing to further extremes that you don't think are going to come. Like, obviously, what happens with Ashley's ex and the, the paint can Home Alone moments, which there's a big build-up to. You realise, I mean, a few seconds before it happens quite how badly wrong that's going to go or or right in horrible little Luke's head. That's exactly what he wanted to happen. Um, you have a few seconds to kind of build up to that, but the escalation even from the paint can incident to Luke shooting Garrett, like, brutally with a yeah. shotgun, is it? Right in front of him. And Garrett, like, just bleeding out on the sofa and being like, Whoa, like, panicking and being like, oh my god, you shot me. Yeah. Even, it would be easy for the film to peek at the paint can and then not really know where to go from there. And it manages to keep getting worse in a, in a, in a successful way. Well done, everybody involved. Completely agree with you. And that moment with the, cake, the, the paint can is brilliant because it is... It's almost funny in how extreme it is and, and, and how like unbelievable this film has gotten at this point. But also it's really fucking horrible, isn't it? And again, I talked about this a bit with when we when we talked about Home Alone, because that paint can scene in Home Alone is obviously really funny. Like it's a really funny piece of physical comedy, and it's all to do with those sound effects. You get the dong of the paint can and they fall backwards and their facial expressions. You see what happens in filmmaking if you just twist that slightly, if the if the sound effect isn't so much this gong. But it's this kind of this crunch Ooh. of like, yeah, of the of the skull crunching, followed by the drips of blood and everything, and that kind of like silence that follows it, you know? It's very clever. And the very gooey red blood mixing in with the yellow yes. paint. The yellow paint yes. was a great choice for that moment. Really great. Really great. And actually the whole look of the film, right, is really fun. Like I think compared to Housebound's kind of like murky run down dusty old house this is such a clean it looks like the sort of house you get in a teen slasher movie right it's that glossy suburban house beautiful furniture big open spaces and everything is so bright and colorful yeah too, isn't all the it? colors you know, pop. really kind of that interesting mix the one thing with the paint can though and that again for me is like slightly weird with the tone of this movie is that the the tone of the film is very very dark ultimately and it's very sweary as well it does hold back on the gore. You well, once the paint can happens, you see the slightly, you know, grizzly blood mixing with the paint, but it holds back on showing you his head caved in. But then yeah. also it will show people being kind of shot point blank and and doing horrible things. It, it was weird to me. I didn't quite settle on what the film decided its own line was of where it was going to stop at certain things and push further into others because there are actually things in it that feel a lot more extreme than the visual of the bloodied head would have been. Agreed. If that makes sense. I completely agree with you. I think that can only be a budgetary thing, right? Like, I imagine... Because I feel like had Chris Peckover been able to show us that, I think he would have. Because I think that would have absolutely added to the overall nastiness of this film. To see that guy's head cave in from the paint can i could and it's a very 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 low budget film and i can only imagine it must have been that that, that they didn't show it because absolutely you'd think this movie would show that right like you say like because it gives us nastier stuff than that in a way but just nothing that involves huge amounts of practical effects and so i imagine that must be the reason you know it doesn't look like a low budget film i think that's the thing it was it's so well done that it doesn't look or feel no. like a low budget film in the way that no shade intended housebound does it wears that on its sleeve i think whereas this manages to create something that as you say yeah feels glossy and mainstream and which again feels part of the subversion of what it's doing it looks like a hollywood movie and then it peels back the layers on what's happening there can i tell you 
where I thought this was going because yeah. I had an idea and it's I am absolutely somebody who advocates for never get your hopes upon a certain thing happening in a film sure. let the film be the film and don't be mad at the film for not doing what you thought was going to happen but genuinely because of the title and because of the tone and because of how horrible Luke ends up being I genuinely thought the end of this film was going to be Santa turns up yes. and he's like you're on the naughty list and he wipes out this kid and I was waiting for that like pulpy genre poppy element to come in of like all this crazy shit's happened but don't worry Santa's here kid's on the naughty list Santa I don't know kills the kid or takes him off somewhere or something Yeah, and then that never came and I was like oh I'm just left with this feeling of like oh have been through something in the last hour especially i completely agree it could have easily done that i think um but instead it goes somewhere so much darker and finally then how do you find the way this film wraps up because again really bleak right when you think that he's actually killed ashley and you really do think like that's it he's won she's dead and it's almost like the film becomes this tense moment of is he gonna get away with it he has to like reset the house and clean everything up and put himself back in bed and balance the pencil back on the doorknob and all of that stuff where again it's kind of putting us in this kind of situation where we're almost like sort of empathizing with him as he tries to get away with it um yeah how did you find that sort of final moment of the film so conflicted because i was pretty upset with how nasty this had gotten how like everybody is dead except the kid and then it felt again daring in terms of like now obviously you don't condone anything that luke has done but it's like you're just with this character now is he gonna wait gonna get away with it you are gonna watch and yeah. you're also gonna feel the stress of like oh is he gonna get away with it or not And we don't want to side with this kid but I, yeah, I, I was mm-hmm. I was upset of what happened to Ashley because I was like, this is so horrible. Uh, Dacre Montgomery obviously comes in from Stranger Things as the other like ex boyfriend, and he gets a kind of gnarly death as well in the garden. Which basically the film does that just to bring another person in just to kill them off, and it's like, oh god, haven't I been through enough? Then Ashley gets it in the <laughs> neck, and I was like, oh, yeah. that is that is so dark that is really bleak because yeah. again she has just done absolutely nothing wrong and the film does a fantastic job from the opening five minutes of just making you go oh this kid's a bit weird oh, oh i hate God. this kid oh yeah. i really hate this kid yeah and so then yeah very conflicted feelings when you're watching him scrabble around like can he get away with it could he possibly get away with it is he going to be able to balance the oh he's not going to be able to balance the pencil on the door fuck you little boy and yeah. then he does and you're like no and I am so, so relieved. Obviously, the payoff of Ashley saving herself with a bit of duct tape, which they set up quite nicely earlier in Incredible. the film, Incredible. is very good. And just her being wheeled into the ambulance, just flipping the kid off through the window and just so knowing, good. knowing that he's not going to get away with it ultimately it doesn't give you the moment of actually seeing that happen, of knowing that that's happened. I think the film, again, holds back in letting you feel that relief. You see where this is going to go, but you don't get the release of actually watching that happen. Yeah. Um, I, I needed that glimmer of hope. My, my, my feelings on the film like immediately go whoop, a little bit back up again once the reveal that Ashley was still alive came through. Because I was like, I don't actually know if I could take it <laughs> No, <laughs> if she I com- was I com- really killed off. I completely agree with you. I think this movie needed this. Like, it's funny because we talked about this with the, in the context of The Strangers where, spoiler alert, the very last second of The Strangers, it turns out that Liv Tyler, who we thought was dead, like comes to life as a jump scare. And it almost felt a bit of a cop-out in that because I was like, I didn't really believe that Liv Tyler would have survived that and that wasn't the film we were in whereas this movie I feel like I needed that too I think the film needed that I think we all needed that that incredible moment when Ashley is wheeled into the back of an ambulance on a stretcher and looks up at Luke and just flips him the bird <laughs> as the film ends and it's like yes you just want to kind of stand up and cheer at that moment I think don't you? it does make you want to know what happened in the like days afterwards obviously this film I don't think got a sequel no. and you know you don't want to see sequel to everything and you don't want to need a sequel to everything but i think i was really invested in how horrible this kid was and so desperate to see him get absolutely destroyed by santa or quite literally anybody else yeah that i would love to know what happens in the in the minutes hours days 
following this film and, and how that unfolds. I think you could get a sequel maybe like in a few years time that takes place like a decade later, right? And it could be like Halloween, like you find out he went to a, a facility for the criminally insane. He spent 10 years there and then he comes back 10 years later on Christmas Eve or something, you know, as an adult. It's like the Michael Myers origin story almost, isn't you it? You could do something because of what it's playing with. You could do something that he comes back into a world of very different sensibilities and, yes. you know, still a long way to go, but much you know, better, hopefully, <laughs> understandings of uh, of gender dynamics and not being a creepy, yes. horny 12-year-old. Yeah, suddenly, like, 12-year-olds are all really sensitive suddenly when he comes out <laughs> and they're all much more progressive and, uh, yeah, that would be really, really funny. I, I, I agree. I would love to see... You, you want the satisfaction of seeing what happens to this kid next, I think, but... Um, but having said that, it's a very fun little sting ending. I did really enjoy it. It's a such a it's such a strange film, and it's obviously not one that has that kind of mainstream appeal necessarily because it's so dark and weird. I think, but um, yeah, do you think this is a movie, Ben, that you'd recommend to people ultimately? I think the people who I think could handle it maybe for the first half hour I was like oh yeah I'm gonna recommend this to everyone who wants some spooky Christmas fun and then beyond that I was like oh yeah (laughs) select friends uh trusted people uh people who I think would respond to the ride that the film is uh maybe not on a wider basis uh my wife watched neither of these films with me i don't think she would have enjoyed either of them but in fact i did uh over her birthday meal last night in a quite nice restaurant in london she was like what was that film that you were watching for for the horror podcast and i was like oh well it was better watch out she was like what's it about and i told her the plot and she just said that's horrible that's really <laughs> horrible and i was like do you know what it kind of was but in a good it way it kind of was it kind of was <laughs> so um yeah. i don't know what this says about me ben but this is a bit of a christmas staple for me that's i kind great. of love this movie i think it's i think it's a wonderfully mean festive horror film with something interesting to say i think so i i do really like it and i like that it goes there um as all the best home invasion movies do so there you go um well ben thank you so much for joining me to discuss these films it's been so much fun to have you on the pod finally and i know that maybe home invasion might not be your favorite subgenre but do you have a favorite if i was to ask for your favorite home invasion movie what would it be Ooh, it would probably be Ah, maybe Hush, maybe... Good choice. I've loved your... Adam Wingard double bill of your next and the guest. I mean, both of those films. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something that brings that fun element. Uh, I especially really respond to the way that Adam Wingard... um, knows genre so well and knows that you know genre well and you feel like you're on a level with him and he's saying to you, we all know what I'm doing here let's have some fun i absolutely respond to that absolutely and so yeah the way that that plays out in your next and the guest in very different ways uh that is an incredible double bill i think i need to double bill that soon i haven't seen uh, either of them in far mm. too long so i'm gonna go for that they're very easy to double bill actually both really fun so much banging soundtracks they're both great really good choices i love it and uh ben as it's your first time on this podcast as well i've got to ask you as the final question what is your favorite horror movie oh you did warn me that this was coming up and i haven't got an answer prepared (laughs) i don't that's such a huge i know It's it's an impossible question really that is an impossible question um favorite well Evil Dead 2 nice. is absolute top five for me. Mm. Um, I have seen, I saw it when I was at university in Newcastle at the Tyneside Cinema for the first time. I'd never seen it before. I saw it at three in the morning during an all-night marathon full with a packed audience who had all seen the film, loved it, all shouted groovy at the same time. It, like That experience <laughs> yes. rewired my brain. And yeah, big Evil Dead fan ever since. I had Evil Dead 2 as the film on my stag do. Um, Amazing. So uh, just that, that. Yeah, exactly. Did, mix of like, uh, did, you, did this help you get the job working with Chris Hewitt saying that you... Your favorite it probably didn't Evil hurt, Dead. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, that's a... I mean, it's a perfect movie, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely yeah. perfect movie. Incredible. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining me. It's been such a treat to have you on. And just remind people again where they can find you where they can find your podcast if they want to come and check you so out. So I am clinging to the dying embers of Twitter slash X. Uh, I'm at Ben S. Travis. And you can read my stuff at empireonline.com and in Empire Magazine. 
And you can hear me on the Empire podcast and the Empire spoiler specials, where you'll also find a sprinkling of Mike Munzer. So you should go and check those out. And yeah, come and join us on Disneyversity at Disneyversity. No, Disney without the EY. It's like the like the university bit. We just don't want to get sued by Disney. So we haven't no. written the full word Disney in the name of our podcast. It's Disneyversity. Um, yeah, even if you don't think you're into Disney, it's like a, we're trawling through decades of hollywood history through some fascinating films and as mike says there is a really huge amount of horror stuff i'd love to talk just generally horror and disney with you at some point mike because there is an insane amount there so yeah absolutely one day we're going to cover all those weird fucking 30s and 40s ones that are like actual nightmares aren't they yes Yes. so good Uh, all hail chernobog from the end of fantasia incredible there you go well ben thank you so much for joining me thanks mike this has been so much fun and that's it for this week thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brilliant guest ben travis so please do get in touch let me know what you thought of this week's episode and what you think of these two films i know better watch out is pretty divisive i would love to hear your takes on it please do get in touch you can email me evolution of horror at gmail.com you can also find us on all the socials facebook twitter instagram letterboxd blue sky threads etc and if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners you can join the evolution of horror discord or the evolution of horror discussion group which can be found on facebook you can find this podcast in all the usual podcast places and i'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating and review on apple podcasts as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners so on to next week then and oh my god next week is the one i've been waiting for a pair of movies that i love so much i basically haven't stopped talking about either of them since they came out next week i'm going to be joined by another brand new guest co-host of the faculty of horror and editor of room morgue magazine andrea subasati is finally going to be on the evolution of horror and she's joining me to discuss two perfect movies as far as i'm concerned we're going to be discussing the invitation from 2015 and speak no evil from 2022 oh my god join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror